Stabilizing an unstable economy, and uh, I was asked to, to go there. Uh, and in fact, Jan Tregel, uh, who knew Minsky very well, was also uh, making a presentation. Okay, so uh, some of you may not know uh, who. A gauche, a bon. Uh, Thank <laughs> you. 
and, uh, and talk mostly about his financial instability hypothesis. And then I'll talk about uh, perhaps the dark side of Minsky's force. And uh, I say here there are six issues. Oh, yeah, six. Okay. Uh, which are listed uh, here. And then at the very end, I'll come to the issue that was in the title, which is, was Minsky a post-Keynesian economist, or was he not? And then I'll be presenting, I mean, different people have different opinions on that, and I'll, I'll give you uh, as well my own opinion uh, on, on this. Okay, so we start with the bright side of, uh, of Minsky. Well, so uh, one, one could say that uh, two, two things uh, that are key. Uh, the first one is that just like Keynes, he thought that uh, there was no natural mechanism that was stabilizing the economy. And this is something that Keynes insists very much upon. Uh, Keynes at some point says, you know, there are two kind, there are two kinds of economists. There are those who believe that at some point the economy will come back to its, uh, well, to say a full employment uh, situation. It may take a long time. It, there may be many jerks, uh, but uh, eventually you'll get there, even despite the fact that they are efficient. And, and then there's another group of economists, and Keynes was putting himself in that group, and Minsky is obviously in that group as well, who thought, no, uh, the, the market mechanism will not bring you back to an equilibrium or a stable equilibrium. Uh, you need some institutions to do it. Um, so Minsky insisted that uh, capitalism is flawed, uh, and is, uh, so the other view that he had in contrast to Keynes was that Keynes thought that uh, the instability was downwards in the sense that the problem was we're going, uh, well, the economy is, uh, tends to be in a <coughs> employment situation, whereas for uh, Minsky, he thought that the fundamental instability was upwards in the sense that he thought, well, at some point banks are going to make too, too much credit and everything will be uh, moving up. Uh, so his key insight, the one which is best known, is, is, is the so-called financial instability hypothesis, which sometimes is also called the financial fragility hypothesis. Uh, more recently, it's more the financial instability hypothesis which has been put forward. Uh, another, oh, so here I have other insights. Uh, demand curves can be upward sloping instead of downward sloping in financial markets. This is something that he mentioned and that you, can, you could find in the literature at the beginning of the financial crisis. There's this paper by Shin who was, ar who was arguing exactly that when he was talking about investment banks. Uh, Shin being somebody who was working at the Fed. Um, uh, Minsky was also a critic of trickle-down economics. Even before Ronald Reagan came into power, uh, so he was criticizing already at that time supply-side economics. Uh, he did not believe that the income of workers and the poor would improve just because of the growth of income of absolute individuals. Uh, he, yeah, he also expressed what we would call today ecological concerns. I mean, it's, there are not too many paragraphs or pages about that, but there, there are some statements which you can find in Minsky, which, in which you could not find in many other post-Indian authors. So uh, he objected to the fruitless inflationary treadmill accompanied by what is taken to be deterioration in the biological and social environment. 
So he calls for a stable population, which is uh, something uh, which is not very much talked about, uh, although I think it's also maybe for concerned with the ecological uh, situation, I think it's something we should be talking about. And a state of discipline wants, so he means, uh, you know, every, everybody wants to have luxury goods, <laughs> everybody wants more, and so we should be more disciplined. Um, yeah, th there's a, f a few other things that are worth uh, mentioning among his insights. Uh, at some point, he was insisting very much that um, if the Treasury has its account at the central bank, the federal government debt is safe. So this is a, an idea very much promoted by modern monetary theory or the so-called neo capitalist uh, another thing I, I think is relevant, he says, the achievement of market power is the proximate goal of firms. You can find this idea also uh, in Galbraith. Um, you know, our neoclassical colleagues say the, the, the goal is profit maximization, some tend to say growth maximization, but uh, I, I think market power is really what the, these firms are looking at. Uh, the salaries of overhead labor are really extracted from the surplus generated by the firm. So this was written, I think, before there was this huge increase in the salaries of uh, presidents and vice presidents uh, of firms. And this is something which is highly relevant today. He had this working paper in 1987 at the beginning of securitization where he was saying that securitization will become important and will lead to further globalization of the financial markets, and this is exactly what we have observed. He did not necessarily object to financialization, but he could see the implications uh, that it would have for international finance. Uh, he had this idea of super cycle, so, there may be a financial crisis, but it's more like the succession of small financial crises that eventually lead to big financial crises. This is something that has been uh, emphasized by our colleague uh, Tom Pally. Uh, and of course, uh, it's important to know what the institutions are, and he has insisted quite a lot on the notion of fundamental or radical uncertainty, which is a typical uh, post Keynesian idea. Um, now, his view of capitalism and he, himself in 1964, so that, that was almost at the beginning when he was explaining his view of capitalism and the financial instability hypothesis. He says the broadest, broadest hypothesis is that the behavior of an economic system with respect to the real variables is not independent of the financial system of the economy. So one can say that was also a major contribution in the sense that he insisted that the real side of the economy cannot be made <coughs> independent of what's going on on the monetary and the financial side. There's feedback between the two. And I would say that this is fully consistent <laughs> with the stock flow consistent models that you have been discussing for the last four, four days. Uh, and the purpose of which is exactly that. It's to put together the financial side, the financial flows, the, cap the financial stocks, and the real side, and to show the relationships between the two. Um, a sentence that I like from him, from him is when he says, when designing regulations on, on finance, the starting assumption must be that financial markets are destabilizing, not that the financial markets are always right. <laughs> so I think that a lot of our uh, of economists uh, in the 80s, in the 90s, in the 2000s, they were, they were starting to assume that uh, nothing will ever go wrong. 
with the Eurozone, I think that's also what happened. They designed something under the assumption that it could never go wrong, but and, and then in 2010, things started to go wrong, and uh, they were just not ready for it. Um, and of course, there's a need for a lender of last resort, and uh, he thought, well, when things really go wrong, the government has to step in, and uh, there'll be losses. There's likely to be losses for the government, but this is it, unfortunately. They have to be socialized. Um, so, what is the financial stability hypothesis? And here I have a, a brief statement of it. If I, if I were, here I try to summarize it in four sentences. <laughs> of course, it's much more complicated than that, but basically, yeah, leverage ratios or debt ratios must rise in the boom as economic activity proceeds. So that's his main idea. At some point, after a few years of tranquil uh, activity, at some point the leverage ratios, the debt ratios, will start to rise. Uh, the way he expresses this is to use those three expressions as hedge finance, speculative finance, Ponzi finance, don't necessarily like this description of, uh, of things, uh, but that's the way that most people know uh, this uh, hypothesis. Then debt ratios have risen, and then he argues that in the boom, it must be the case that interest rates will rise as well. So those two factors put together will eventually provoke the financial crisis in the sense that people will be unable to make their payments uh, and, and therefore there will be a financial <coughs> crisis. Um, okay, then he has these uh, paradoxical statements which uh, have been picked up uh, with the 2008 crisis. Uh, the longer an economy is in a tranquil state of growth, the less likely it is to remain in such a state. Each state nurtures forces that lead to its own destruction. So here I'm quoting him or citing him exactly. Stability is destabilizing. So this has been uh, said often. And in 1983, I, so 35 years ago, I called this the paradox of tranquility. I think the expression has been picked up by a number of people. And the reason for this is the one which is on the last line. Uh, history of success will tend to diminish the margin of safety that business and bankers require. So businesses and bankers take more risk. Okay, why this is so well, uh, once you agree with this, you don't need a PhD uh, anymore. Uh, yeah, once, uh, once things are work, seem to be working really well, then there is some euphoria. Uh, you can see that all of your neighbors are making money because they are borrowing. Uh, they are buying a house, the price of the house is going up, or they are buying uh, financial assets, stock market shares, and the, their prices are going up. So when you see that, at some point you jump into the wagon, and, uh, and everybody believes that they are being rich uh, because they are smart. You know, all these people are making a lot of money and they think they're smart. And so you think that, well, we're, we're so smart, we'll never be making any mistake. And this will continue uh, for a while. Uh, and as uh, was said by uh, Alan Blinder, managers are rewarded by dancing as long as the music does not stop. So bankers will keep making loans to new customers uh, as long as it seems that everybody else is doing the same uh, around. Um, 
and those who warn about impeding disasters are proven wrong time and time again. And they get fired. In fact, I, I uh, have been going to a few of the Minsky conferences that happen every year. I think there have been 20 of them now. And uh, often we meet uh, people who were working in the financial, for financial companies and uh, around 2008, 2009, so we, some of them were saying, well, I, I told you about this, I told my company about this, but because I was the only one who was not making as much money as my other colleagues because I was more prudent in the investments of the, of the fund, uh, I got fired. <clears throat> so, this, so the only people who, fund, who remain in these uh, finance companies uh, or banks are the ones who, the, the only ones who remain there are the ones who are taking a lot of risk and the ones who are more prudent, who would give prudent advice, they get fired and, and so things get more and more risky. Market participants and economists believe that a new era has arrived. Uh, maybe most of you were too young, but this is exactly what we were being told when there was the internet bubble around 1998, 1999, 2000. All these companies were making zero profits, they were all making losses, and everybody was saying, yeah, but this is a new era, this is a new model. You guys don't understand what's going on there. And uh, yeah, and uh, if, you say, if you say, well, eventually the real estate prices will not rise, will stop rising, uh, people will say, yeah, it's true that they have always stopped rising in the past, but just this time it will be different. <laughs> okay, and Keynes uh, knew that very well. Um, yeah, <coughs> worldly wisdom teaches that it's fair for reputation to fail conventionally by following everybody than to succeed unconventionally. Yeah, what, uh, so why does this happen in the financial system? It's because the financial system is different from, uh, say, the, the other economic activities like manufacturing or even uh, providing some services. Uh, as I say here, there are no intrinsic limits to the amount of credit that can be granted by the banking system. I mean, when somebody comes to you and says uh, we're running out of money, it doesn't make uh, it doesn't make any sense. A bank can create can keep creating loans as long as it maintains the trust of other banks. Banking is based on confidence, conventions, and I think a good example, uh, as I mentioned there, is the Icelandic banks. I mean, they were making huge amount of loans. They come from a country where there's about 300,000 inhabitants. Uh, but they could keep making all these loans because the other banks were make, uh, lending the, the money to, to these Icelandic banks. So as long, uh, there was no limit to the amount they could lend. The only limit is this trade-off between the appeal for profits and the fear of losses. So if there is little fear of losses, then you just go keep on making uh, more loans. And the fear of losses was getting weakened by securitization because the banks could make the loans, they could get rid of them, get them securitized, sell them to what we were told to be uh, more uh, knowledgeable people which in the end turned out it wasn't true at all. Uh, and, and, so, and so, again, you know, I would say you don't need a PhD to uh, argue that securitization can uh, lead to huge risk in the global economy. And there is this other uh, paradox which one can attribute to uh, Paul Macaulay. Macaulay was the chief economist at PIMCO which at that time uh, was the first or the second biggest uh, fund uh, in, the, in the world. 
And so Macaulay was saying rating agencies thought the default rates would be low because they had been low. But they had been low because the degradation of underwriting standards was driving up asset prices. So, you know, up to about 2006, none of these uh, people who had obtained mortgages to purchase a new house, um, almost none of them were defaulting. They were not defaulting because it was always possible to get a new loan and always possible to sell the house to someone else who was getting a new loan from a bank. So default rates were low, but not because the situation was good or the, the, the fundamentals were right, as we were told by our neoclassical colleagues at the time, uh, but because the banks were making too many loans. They were, and everybody could get a loan, and therefore anybody could sell, buy and, and sell the house. So that's the paradox, of, I call that the paradox of degrading standards. The standards are going down, but it seems that the, situ the fundamentals are better. Uh, yeah, here I have a few sentences, so uh, I, I, can, I can skip that, where I show that Minsky had this notion of uh, stock flow consistency. Maybe he was influenced by Wynne Godley, because Godley was also at the Levy Institute um, at the beginning, starting in the beginning of the uh, 1990s until about 2002 or 2003. Uh, and, uh, but here, what we can see is uh, what Minsky is writing in those articles is, uh, well, the 1996 one at least, is identical to what Wayne Godley would be saying. Um, yeah, and he was insisting on the cash flow approach. Okay, so this is the good side uh, of Minsky as I see it. Now I'll move to what is what I call the dark side of Minsky's force, in the sense that uh, I mean Minsky had great ideas, but uh, just like Keynes, I, I don't think he was right on everything. And so uh, I, I, when I made the presentation uh, in Russia in honor of Minsky, so to speak, I thought it was also interesting to see uh, maybe the weaknesses that he had, that it's not because we are a fan of Minsky that we must blindly believe everything he says. Okay, so uh, there are six issues. Um, and so here they, they are, and, uh, and I'm gonna deal with each one of them uh, in turn. <coughs> Okay, so the first one is uh, the financial instability hypothesis deals with firms, but what about the household? Um, and, uh, and that's the weakness, that's the first weakness of Minsky. He thought, I mean, when you read him, he keeps talking about the banks and the firms, but he never mentions or hardly ever mentions uh, the household. The, um, in particular, uh, he did not realize that in 1929, the main problem was not so much the debt ratios of firms, when, when the Americans had the, the great, uh, great Depression, when there was the, the, the crash. Uh, basically, what had risen, the, the debt ratio that had risen in the 1920s in the US, was the debt ratio of households because they were speculating on the stock market, so, uh, so they were borrowing on, uh, from banks. And secondly, they were, there was also a real estate boom in the 1920s. Uh, so my view of the, of the crisis, uh, 1929 and 1930, is that it, it was more related to the households than to the firm. Uh, here a statement of Minsky, 1982, the typical financing relation for consumers and housing debt can amplify, but can amplify, but cannot initiate a downturn in income and employment. And I think this is contrary to empirical evidence, 
uh, which can, you can find, for instance, in Sherman, uh, who is a Marxist, in Lemer, who is a neoclassical econometrician, who, who they both show the importance of the real estate sector in the US uh, post the World War II business cycle. So he was weak on that. Uh, we're grateful to Tom Pally, who uh, already 20 years ago, 1996, produced an article where he extended the Minsky analysis to the household sector. And then there's been a number of models that have tried to, uh, to do the same, especially since the financial crisis. So the, the main lesson to coming from these models is that household debt is good in the short run, but it may have a negative impact in the, in the long run. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, the Kim and Serfield article uh, explain this uh, particularly uh, well. Uh, three exceptions which I found or which were given to me by uh, Jan Kregel in the Minsky had an article in 1964 in the American Economic Review, and in that paper, he has a graph uh, with two dimensions, where instability depends on both the business debt ratio and the household debt ratio. So that's a, about the only place where he gets interested in the debt ratio of households. Uh, there's also another uh, citation which you can see from here, which comes, uh, which I took from Jan Kregel, where he, he gets worried what happens if the price of real estate should fall very sharply. This will have a very negative impact on the net worth of households, and eventually business firms will be affected. Uh, there will be defaults, repossessions of houses which is exactly what we had in 2008 in the States, and losses by financial intermediaries. So this is, uh, and, and then finally, there's uh, in uh, the, his book, John Maynard Keynes, uh, Minsky says, in a world where households borrow, another layering of debt exists whose foundation is household income, mainly wages. That's just the sentence, you know, and besides that, nothing. So uh, I would say that that's an important uh, weakness. Um, again, there's this paper by Paul McCauley, who was a, he was a Minsky fan. And, you know, he would go and say, well, I always have this uh, book of Minsky <coughs> on, my, on my shelf in my, in my bedroom. So he, he, he used these three terms that I mentioned, hedge finance, speculative finance, quantity finance, to describe the American mortgage system just before the financial crisis. Um, so yeah, hedge finance was the standard mortgage. Speculative finance was this interest only in mortgages, uh, which meant that you would only pay interest and you would never reimburse the, the capital of your mortgage. So that's already speculative. What if the price of your house goes down? And then Ponzi finance, where in fact you had negative amortization mortgages for two years. Um, so where where you, you did not e you did not even pay interest. <laughs> you didn't even pay the interest. Or if you want, for two years you had a, a rate of interest which was say at one percent. The normal rate of interest, say, was 4%. You were only paying 1% for two years. And then for the next 28 years, you would be paying 5 or 6% instead of 4. Um, right. And of course, securitization. Uh, Macaulay argued that yeah, that was no good. OK, so that's. That's for the household. Second weakness is that, in our view, and this is something that uh, I have pushed very much as early as 1983. I think the article, uh, yeah, you on the 
on, on your website, you have a paper that I published in English in 1986, very short article on this issue, uh, is there a missing macroeconomic link in Minsky? And I published that in, well, I published another longer version with, uh, in French in 1983. So our view has always been that Minsky is looking at a microeconomic firm, but he is omitting the impact that larger investments have on economic activity and therefore on the profits of firms. So he's omitting the Kaliski's profit equation, so to speak. And uh, I, uh, so, yeah, as I say here, Minsky's financial fragility hypothesis rests primarily on a microeconomic construct, uh, which uh, is found in a famous graph that I'm going to show uh, next. And uh, as an anecdote, I, we, with my colleague Mario Sakarecha from the University of Ottawa, we were invited to go to a conference in honor of Minsky that was being held in Italy at the University, I think of Siena, where uh, Minsky was going every summer. And uh, so it was in his honor. Bergamo? And, huh? Berga? Maybe Bergamo. Berga. Bergamo. And, uh, sorry, yeah. And, uh, and so Mario is the one who went there <laughs> and, he, and he expressed this, this view, you know, and Minsky made an error of composition. He, he forgot this macroeconomic link and apparently there were two reactions. One was a reaction of shock. Oh my God, we never thought about that. And the other reaction was, ooh, how dare you criticize Minsky, our hero. So uh, here is the, the graph, and uh, yeah. here is the graph, and so the idea is that, okay, so here we have the level of investment, and here we have the price of each of these machines. And here is something that this uh, rectangular hyperbola represents retained earnings, internal funds. So if the level of investment is here at I uh, bar, then uh, the retained earnings can finance all of the investment. So there is no increase in debt. If there is an increase uh, in uh, investment, then uh, because people believe there is less risk or whatever, then the, the amount of debt will rise and the idea is that the debt ratio will also rise. So this is true, or of course this is true at the microeconomic level, but at the macroeconomic level it is not true. The reason being that the, this hyperbola will be shifting up. If all the firms make more investment, then there will be more profits in the economy, and so this curve will be shifting up, and then we don't know, uh, we, we need a macroeconomic model to be able to say, depending on the parameters, whether the debt ratio at the end will be higher or lower. We just don't know. So Minsky mentions that, again, in one or two sentences, he does, but you know, as he gets going, then he completely forgets about this macroeconomic implication. So this, I think, is uh, important. So this, this graph uh, is also an important pedagogical contribution. You can find the graph in, in, all his, in many of it, in, in his two books. Uh, so it has been used also by lots of different people, but it is only valid at the level of the firm. I mean, if you look at the macro, you have to realize that the hyperbola will be shifted. Um, right, so here what I'm saying is that, yeah, he, he knew about it, but uh, nowhere, however, does he integrate formally these Kaliskian analytics to an explanation of why higher leverage ratios are uh, a consequence, a consequence that, that something that must happen of an, of an economic expansion. 
There is, therefore, an obvious missing macroeconomic link in his formal exposition of his financial fragility hypothesis. And I think that it's related somehow to him not having read uh, Kalecki. The only Kalecki that he knew up until around 1977 or 1978 was uh, the Kalecki, uh, Kalecki's uh, article on uh, the rising, what is it called? Uh, the rising risk. Uh, um, idea of Minsky that as firms are borrowing more and more, it becomes more and more difficult to borrow. The, incre the, the increasing, increasing risk, risk the increasing risk uh, principle. But the, the other part of Kalecki linked to uh, his uh, profit <coughs> equation, he only discovered it around 77, 78. Uh, because otherwise it should have been obvious to him. But even in his book in 1986, he, although he mentions, he writes about this Kalecki's profit equation, it's not embedded in his view about the financial fragility hypothesis. Uh, yeah, by the way, the, there's an alternative view of the downturn. I mean, for Minsky, the, the recession occurs because people take too many risks. And at some point, the thing explodes because uh, interest payments become too high. But there's an alternative version, which is one by Myron Gordon, who is very well known in finance uh, economics, who towards the, the end of his life became a post-Kintian. And uh, he argues exactly the opposite. For him, for uh, Gordon, it's the switch towards a more prudent behavior rather than continuing reckless behavior that would be at the origin of the downturn. For Gordon, you have these entrepreneurs, they are making more and more money, and at some stage, they have made so much money that they start becoming worried. What if I start losing my money? <laughs> and so they start saving more and investing less, and for him, for Myron Gordon, that's the cause of the, of the downturn. And Toporowski, who is uh, uh, a fan of, uh, of Mikhail Kalecki, also believes that the boom ends as firms become more prudent, and as they start investing in real assets less and more into financial assets. So you hear, yeah, it's just to say that among post Keynesians, there are alternative views about what leads to the downturn. The third weakness is what about rising interest rates? Um, so in my paper in 1986, uh, okay, maybe I should tell the story. My, I submitted that paper to the Journal of post Indian Economics around 1983. And then I got, uh, it was, I was asked to resubmit, and I got the manuscript with lots of comments on the manuscript. So at those, in those days, we had to submit on paper. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> What's had, paper? We, we had to actually send the paper by mail. We, there was no internet. And, What's uh, mail? <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and so I got back the paper with all these marks, and I think it was Minsky. <laughs> who had made many, many comments. And so I resubmitted a new version where I was nicer uh, to Minsky and where I took some of his, uh, yeah, some of his arguments in consideration. And so I, I said, well, may maybe he's right about rising interest rates simply because if there is an investment boom and the investment sector um, is more import becomes more and more important, the rate of growth is higher, then indeed this may lead to higher inflation. I mean, you know, you think about the Phillips curve and all that. So, uh, in, in, under those circumstances, one could understand why we would have rising interest rates. 
in the boom because of inflation. Uh, but Minsky had more than this in mind. He, I, I mean, he thought it was a natural uh, phenomenon that was not necessarily related to the central bank. So in, from that standpoint, I thought, well, he's got a kind of neoclassical uh, view. And in fact, uh, yeah, as I say here, the, the financial instability hypothesis was more or less put forward even before the 1960s. You can see it in, in some form in a 1957 paper that was published in the American Economic Review. And uh, if you read the paper carefully, he's got a formal model, which he abandoned uh, later, which leads Minsky to conclude that economic expansions lead to higher debt and leverage ratios for business. But if you read the paper carefully, you realize that the macro model is based on a loanable funds approach that you know, it is not Keynesian whatsoever. So I would say that at that time, he, he was more influenced perhaps by University of Chicago, Harvard, than by uh, Keynesian. So I, I wrote a paper about this, Minsky and Loadable Fund. Um, for Minsky in 1957, and you can find that article in the 1982 book, uh, Can It Happen Again? You can find that article. Uh, the interest rate is determined by the demand curve for investment, ex ante saving, whatever that is, and the terms upon which holders of liquidity are willing to substitute earning assets for money. Okay. Um, but in Minsky's original exposition of this, interest rates rise because firms are over in debt. And why are they over indebted? If they are over indebted because of the lack of saving that forces firms to borrow credit money to finance their investment. If you are a Kaliskian or a Keynesian, your view is that if there is more saving, this will slow down economic activity, firms will make less profits, uh, their inventories, unwanted inventories, are likely to rise, and therefore this will force them to borrow more. I mean, this, this is, if you have higher saving, it should make the situation of firms worse. But Minsky, in that paper, is saying exactly the opposite. He's saying that if there is less saving, it will make the situation of business firms worse. So he's got a loanable funds approach in that paper. That, this is exactly, where is Christopher? This is exactly what the fellow who wrote the chapter on Austrian economics says in the chapter. He's saying at some point, the boom get, gets uh, into trouble because people are not saving enough, which is exactly what Minsky is saying. So from, from here, in that paper, 1957, he's a neo-Austrian. He's not Keynesian, he's neo-Austrian. Uh, uh, yeah, I got the statement here from uh, Mera and Hultzman, who are in this uh, rethinking economic. I don't understand how you dare publish that. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. Yeah, the, the problem is that without the desire to actually save more, the new projects will be unsustainable. The funds required to sustain the construction are lacking. So this is not Keynesian whatsoever. This is anti-Keynesian. Uh, and yeah, again, he's got another sentence. He claims that the excess of ex-ante saving over induced investment will be utilized to reduce bank debt. So again, he's saying that if there is more saving, it will be good for the firms. They will be able to reimburse their debt. So again, completely neo-Austrian. Uh, so uh, 
the, the next uh, paragraph is exactly what I told you. Uh, in, in, in Keynes, in Kaleski, any excess of savings over investment will lead to unsold production. That's the Marxist realization, pro profit realization problem, and hence to an increase in the debt of producers. Okay. Um, fortunately for us, his later works avoid this confusion. Uh, fourth weakness, it's about inflation theory. And in my view, Minsky is making exactly the same mistake as Augusto Canziani, who was the leader of the Italian uh, circuit school. Uh, they both assume that production and hence capacity utilization in the consumption goods sector is a given and cannot be increased. So that's when he's talking about uh, inflation theory. Hence, in the view of Minsky and Graziani, any increase in the share of employment of the investment sector or in the government sector, for that matter, but must necessarily lead to an increase in the rate of inflation of consumer prices. Uh, in the post kinton theory today, the rate of utilization is considered to be endogenous. And so if there is an increase in government activity or in investment, this will have feedback effects on in the consumption sector, but the rate of utilization will absorb this increase in economic activity, and it does not necessarily lead to an increase in inflation. And in fact, that's exactly what we have observed with, uh, say, the United States or Canada coming out of the financial crisis. Okay, so uh, yeah, that, that was another thing that we must mention. What about endogenous money? Uh, so if, uh, I don't know if I say it here, but you know, in, uh, did you discuss the horizontalist, uh, no, horizontalist, structuralist? Not in a lot of detail. No, but you don't need. So there was this discussion between horizontalist and structuralist, and Minsky is <coughs> much closer to the, the so-called structuralist camp, in the sense that for him, he's not focusing so much on reverse causality between, say, reserves, uh, deposits and loans. He's focusing more on the fact, as is written up, up here, he's focusing more on the fact that uh, th there is uh, the velocity of money can, can change, uh, on the fact that there, is, there are financial innovations that uh, will increase the liquidity when uh, economic agents need more uh, liquidity. And so he still sees the supply of reserves by the central bank as the main constraint to loan creation. And in fact, Caldor in 1958, when he talks about some form of money endogeneity, uh, has the same view. He believes the velocity of money is flexible and Um, so it's, it's only in the 19, 1990s get that his views appear to be more in line with the reverse causation argument that you can find in Caldor already in 1970, 1982, Eichner, Moore, Randy Ray, and central bankers. So that's uh, another place where a little bit we and then the last uh, issue I want to bring up before I come to the question, it was Hyman Minsky or Post Kinton or was he not, is uh, the fact that Minsky, just like Paul Davidson, still relies on the neoclassical U-shaped unit cost curves. So when you look, uh, I mean, he doesn't have a graph very often, but when he does, he draws the, the unit cost curve with this U shape, which is the standard neoclassical shape, which is uh, linked to the, at some point you have diminishing marginal cost, uh, the, sorry, diminishing returns, mar marginal returns, and therefore increasing marginal cost. Whereas the standard view is the one which is uh, down here, which is one where the marginal cost is constant and where the unit cost is 
continually decreasing up to full capacity. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, despite the, but as I said, you read Kalecki more in detail in the late 1970s, uh, but when he writes his book, gets published in 1986, he still has the U curve. Uh, whereas, for instance, Eichner and Kriegel, uh, in their article in the Journal of Economic Literature, where they were presenting post keynesian economics as a new paradigm, they had a graph, which is exactly this one. Uh, so it's a, Minsky, as we will see, was associated with the other post keynesians as early as 1970. So it's a little bit strange that he never picked it up. But mind you, Paul Davidson never picked it up, uh, or he did only in his book in 1972, and then forget about it. Just, excuse me, it's macro or micro cost curve? It's, it's at the level of the individual firm. But My then you could have also a pass of composition here, haven't you? Yeah, well, that's the argument of some people. Yeah, okay, just yeah, 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 you're quite right. I mean, you, okay, let's say it's my fault, <laughs> just to be sure. <laughs> okay, um, so let's move on to, oh uh, yeah, there's the last controversy, uh, which I added uh, a, a few days ago because I, I just happened to have seen it, you know, I'm not on Facebook, so I'm a bit, I'm like two years late, but about uh, one year ago or two years ago, there was this discussion about whether Minsky was truly related to modern monetary theory because some people have found uh, a video where Minsky says, uh, well, I'm uh, very worried about uh, budget deficits of the government and we must come back to a balanced budget. We, it would be even good if we could have some surpluses. Um, and so according to Bill Mitchell, who is one of the main modern monetary scholars uh, who is in Australia, uh, he argues uh, that in the mid-1980s, Minsky started to articulate ideas that were consistent with some sound finance. And so for him, it was, it was you know, he didn't even want to put Minsky among the founding fathers of MMT for this reason. Uh, so Ray has just written, uh, just if, uh, written a, a, a Levy Institute working paper where he responds to this in, in great detail and where uh, he says, yes, uh, Minsky's view on functional finance became much more nuanced starting in the 1980s. Uh, and then he points out that Abel Lerner also uh, made his ideas more uh, Okay, so that's the end of this part. And, uh, and so, yeah, was Minsky a post or not? So uh, maybe that's the part that is of most interest <laughs> to many of you. Um, well, first off, of course, you know, when you, it's, it is always very important when you talk about someone to put the date in parentheses. I mean, if you say, Lavoie believes that, believes this, believes that, you must always put the date, because maybe Lavoie has changed his mind. Lavoie 1983 is not the same as Lavoie 2018, 35 years later. And, and so this, this, so it's the same for Minsky, of course. Uh, but, I, so I'll give you my conclusion before I conclude. Uh, I am, I mean, for me, it is very clear that Minsky uh, is clearly a key member of the post keynesian community. Whatever you hear from others, uh, that's my view, and it's also the view of a number of uh, uh, colleagues in the history of economic thought. Um, but as I tried to explain to you before, you know, some of the ideas that Minsky has put forward were influenced at the very beginning by alternative theories, by more neoclassical or Austrian uh, theories. Uh, still, a number of authors claim that Minsky was not a true post keynesian economist. So, uh, and the argument is usually that, well, Minsky has never declared himself to be uh, a, a 
Poskin's an economist, and, would, and some would say, uh, is he a self-declared orthodox economist? Well, there's a number of other economists who in the past uh, we consider to be post-Keynesians, but who were always reluctant to use this, uh, to, to be put in that box. So one uh, that is still living is Anthony Thorwald, the person who wrote about the balance of payments constraint, uh, who likes to be called a Keynesian rather than a post-Keynesian. And there's also Thomas Nakopoulos, uh, that was a teacher of Griffith here, uh, who I mentioned yesterday. That you friend. mentioned, did you? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, who also was, re I mean, but the, the reason that they do that is that they call themselves economists. They say, I'm an economist. And so it's not that they refuse to be in the post Indian camp, it's just that they consider that they are true economists, just like our neoclassical colleagues. So that's why they don't like this, uh, this box. Uh, Colander, Holt, and Russell, who have written a series of articles which have annoyed me greatly, <coughs> uh, say that Minsky was an example of someone who we consider to be an economist with heterodox ideas, but who saw himself as part of the mainstream. While he was sympathetic to both post-Keynesian and institutionalist ideas, to label him as either was impossible. Uh, I don't think that any of the three have a particular knowledge of what Minsky said or thought. I mean, they are in no better position than, than I am. Uh, maybe one should ask uh, Randy Ray, who was a student of Minsky, or should ask uh, Steve Fazzari, who was a colleague of Minsky for many, many years. Um, yeah, maybe we, we should. Uh, as I said uh, here, uh, yeah, Minsky has published in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, he has published in uh, mainstream journals, but in the, basically in the 1950s, at a time where it was much easier, where uh, you know, we didn't have this separation, where neoclassical economics was more open than it is now. Uh, Colander uh, also and, and his friends also have another, uh, other statements. This early experience of Minsky at Chicago defined his approach, his attitude towards mainstream economics and explains partly his reluctance to put himself within any particular heterodox school such as post-Keynesian, though he did not mind being associated with either school. He always considered himself working at the edge of mainstream economics as he tried to instill more heterodox views within the mainstream. Well, as we saw before, up until uh, 2000, you could see that his in instilling more heterodox views within the mainstream was a complete uh, failure because he had seven citations in mainstream journals over seven years, which is about one citation per year. So if this was his purpose, uh, <laughs> it was not so successful whatsoever. Paul Davidson has also the, a view on Minsky that Minsky is not a post-Keynesian. Uh, Paul, Paul Davidson is the co-founder of the Journal of Post-Keynesian Economics with Sidney Weintraub, and he made a presentation at the Minsky Summer School in 2015. I was there, I listened to it, he was very courageous, you know, he's in front of all those Minsky fans, <laughs> well, young students, and uh, his conclusion then was, and I quote from the paper that he gave, and that, he, that it was sent to us, I believe one of the reasons that post Keynesians have failed to have a significant impact on mainstream economics is that they appear to be divided as to what is post Keynesian theory. This lecture has, I hope, shown that there remain significant differences between Minsky and myself. Uh, so, uh, and, and the conclusion that Minsky and Davidson are completely different. Uh, he has 
uh, said before, but not, nothing new here in his presentation in 2015, in papers that he wrote in the early 2000s, he was also arguing that Minsky was a kind of a new Keynesian, that he was not really post-Keynesian, not as Paul Davidson is defining it. So according to Davidson, Minsky uh, often told me that he never wanted to be identified as a post-Keynesian. Hence, he fails the test of uh, John King of identifying post-Keynesians as people who identify themselves as post-Keynesians. In reality, Minsky was and always wanted to be a mainstream Keynesian who used the Modigliani variant of the ISLM system and whose major distinction from other mainstream Keynesians was that he possessed knowledge of the actual real-world financial markets. Minsky insisted that he was an orthodox mainstream macroeconomist who happened to emphasize Kaliskian income distribution aspect. So I think that this, my view on this is that Davidson is completely off target. Uh, if you read the book of Minsky in 1975, John Maynard Keynes, and you read at the same time the book of Paul Davidson, Money and the Real World, you, you will see they insist on the very same thing, which is the importance of liquidity in financial markets. I mean, they have a very similar views on the financial markets. And, you know, <laughs> it, it, but Minsky wrote a very negative uh, review of the book by Paul Davidson. It's as if, you know, I'm the one who knows about financial markets, and you know nothing. You, Paul Davidson, you don't know anything. <laughs> and so, uh, the, there was always this kind of animosity between the two. I mean, they would eat together at, at conferences. Uh, that's, that's the other sociology, sociology thing about uh, economists. You know, you would have conferences with the Srapians, the Post-Kinsians. The Post-Kinsians would eat at one table, the Srapians would eat at the other table. <laughs> I think I was the only one who was able to eat with the Srapians, and then the next day eat with the Post-Kinsians next to Minsk, Minsky and Paul Davidson. Anyway, so, uh, I think that, I, I don't think that, uh, Minsky had this Modigliani view of ISLM, not, not at all. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and as I explained, Kalecki and his profit equations only came up around 1978. So it was really a late addition to how Minsky was conceiving the, the real and the financial world. So I, you know, I, I disagree completely with uh, Davidson. Uh, his other reason for rejecting uh, Minsky as a post-Keynesian was that since Minsky refused to adopt Keynes' principle of effective demand as the basic analytical system, and instead adopted an analytical structure that relied on some of the restrictive axioms of the special case classical theory, it is difficult for me to understand why King classifies Minsky as a post-Kinsian, much less the second U.S. post-Kinsian. As I said, Davidson saw Minsky as being close to the new king. So, uh, you know, Davidson had, a, had his own graphs of, uh, he has a kind of, he has a Z equation graph with uh, an aggregate demand graph. And uh, I guess anybody that doesn't like this graph, for him is not a true post-Kinsian. So for instance, I would not be a true post-Kinsian according to this definition. And according to this definition, in fact, the Cambridge Journal of Economics would not be part of post-Kinsian economics because you may know that three or four years ago, uh, the post, uh, or maybe more than that, four or five years ago, there was a little editorial in the Cambridge Journal of Economics saying that um, 
we don't want any more any papers being submitted to us dealing with this dead function. <laughs> well, that was clear enough. And I've never seen one again there. Wrote, I think, the Review of Political Economy is the last one, but last journal has published a paper on this issue. Okay, here is a guy called Daniel Nielsen, who, uh, who is a uh, teaching uh, professor now, who was a student of Perry Merlin. So he has, uh, yeah, he's ambivalent. Uh, Minsky's engagements with the post-Keynesians are consistently ambivalent. He could reasonably be grouped among the post-Keynesians, so Nielsen cites me for on this. But his message does not seem really to have been heard. There is no place in post-Keynesian theory for the survival constraint for position making or for a notion of transit, transient liquidity. And again, I think here is somebody who has not read Paul Davidson book of 1972, and, and Paul Davidson has often said three things, liquidity, liquidity, liquidity. <laughs> so uh, if post Keynesians do not insist on liquidity, then who, who does? You know? So I mean, we have these strange statements by various uh, people. Uh, OK, some facts now. Frederick Lee has written uh, uh, articles and books on how American post Keynesianism was born. <coughs> Minsky was there from the very first meeting back in December 1971. There, there were 15 economists that met at a dinner just before the meeting of the American Economic Association. So all, you know, all very important names, Eichner, Davidson, Asimakopoulos, uh, Don Harris, Boulding, Vicky Chick, Jan Kregel, Ed Nell, they were all there with John Robinson, trying to create a post keynesian movement, and Minsky was there, 1971. He spent his sabbatical at the University of Cambridge in 6970, where, why would he go there? Because at the time, you know, all the post Keynesians were, uh, all the UK post Keynesians were at Cambridge. He participated, as far as I know, to all the post Keynesian summer schools in Trieste in the 1980s. Why would he go there if he didn't think to be associated? He certainly didn't want to associate himself with the Serapians, but he did it with the post Keynesians. And if you look at his book, 75, he mentions that he was highly influenced by the works of John Robinson, Cal Gore, Davidson, Sidney Weintraub. All these guys are post Keynesians. Uh, in his 1978 uh, paper, which is again in that collection, uh, Can It Happen Again? Minsky claims that the financial stability hypothesis is just a variant of post Keynesian economics. So of course, he doesn't agree with with many of the other variants in post keynesian economics. He has his own, but I think it's clear enough that he believes it's part of post keynesian economics. Um, any, um, right, so, you know, he, he keeps, I mean, he keeps uh, associating himself with post keynesian economics. He, he published a, a paper in 1985 called An Introduction to post keynesian Economics. I mean, if he, I mean, I'm not going to write a, a book uh, or a paper called An Introduction to Neo-Austrian Economics. <laughs> so if he, I mean, it seems to me he felt he was close enough to the post keynesians to do that. Uh, yeah, in that paper, he, he associates himself with the school. He adds the, the names of Davidson, Kregel, Morchik, the British post Keynesian, the, the French circuit theorists, and the Calestians. And he says all these people are the ones that he is going to try to describe in his introduction to post Keynesian economics. And then here he has the various uh, key elements of post Keynesian economics that he mentioned in that paper. And I think 
you know, looking at these, one could say, well, yeah, I mean, that's exactly the way post-Keynesian economics is still being seen. And, and he even had this here, the complex system dynamics, which is something which is becoming more and more popular in post-Keynesian circles among my uh, younger colleagues. Uh, if, and then finally, if you, if you read his uh, preface in, uh, I'm coming to the end, uh, uh, his preface to the 1986 book, uh, yeah, I should have taken this out, here being translated in Russian, no. uh, Minsky writes, stabilizing an unstable economy is in the post-Kindian tradition. I mean, how much explicit can he be? which I take to mean that Keynes provides us with the shoulders of the giant. However, being post-Keynesian does not mean being slavishly dependent on the works of the great man, the great man being, in this case, Keynes. Uh, again, he thanks the post-Keynesian contingent, Ian Kregel, Paul Davidson, the late sister, Sidney Weintraub, but then he has this funny uh, sentence where he says, where he is highly, uh, where he says, uh, he also thanks John Robinson, who was often wrong in especially incisive ways. <laughs> Which is rather funny. I should think of that uh, when I, if I write the, the next paper or the next article, if I <laughs> you dislike someone and you can end this thing. <laughs> you thank someone but who, is, who was often so long. <laughs> uh, and so here's the last slide. Uh, in, in 1996, he published a chapter uh, in the proceeding of a conference that was organized at the New School in 1990. He published a chapter titled The Essential Characteristics of post keynesian Economics. Uh, in that article, he says that post-Keynesians have done better at analyzing and explaining the progress of advanced capitalist economies than any other school of thought. Uh, but then he argues that post-Keynesian economics is not wedded, he says again, you know, he repeats this, is not wedded to taking every scrap of Keynes' general theory in later writings as gospel. And I would say, that this is exactly how we should look at Minsky. We should not be wedded to every scrap of, his, of Minsky's books or, 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 or chapters or, or articles as gospel. We have to you know, see what is right and what is not. And so my conclusion is that Minsky sees himself as a post-Indian author and no doubt about that. Thank you.